How many of you like to loop songs all day? It's been an affliction of mine for years where I developed a habit to read, write and even run to music. Now the soundtrack to life was first shaped by iRiver IFP180T which used to be one of the first portable flash memory music players in the world. I used to load it with songs downloaded off the internet, placated my guilt by reasoning that piracy itself was a much more moral choice considering the very high prices of compact discs and music world or the incredible wealth enjoyed by bands such as Metallica or the Beatles. Of course, Lars' ridiculous feud with Napster also helped him. In time, my pattern of use has changed considerably. These days, I stream my music over Spotify, YouTube, and sometimes over Apple. I bet you do as well. And this gives me some guilt. I do not know how much money is going ultimately to the artists. And this is especially for relatively esoteric techno creators, such as satin jackets, which I listened to all over the pandemic, or even rival consoles, which I listened to much more recently. Yes, while there is an explosion of diverse kinds of content, do the economic payouts also end up in the bank accounts of the artists putting in the work? Clearly, everyone is posting or creating something or the other, a short or a reel. But are the spoils distributed equitably? Or is value being squeezed at the bottom of the tube by the workers into the hands of those who own and operate these platforms? These questions prompted me to pick up Rebecca Giblin and Cory Doctorow's book titled Choke Point Capitalism. Welcome to Amal Das Talks, a place for conversations on the law, public policy, politics and technology centered in India. Today, I review Giblin and Doctorow's book that, as per the title, is about how big tech and big content captured creative labor markets and how we'll win them back. I read a digital version of this book which runs into about 312 pages and about 20% of it are references within the footnotes. It's basically a trip talk, a three-part narrative that first dissects the relationship between big content and big tech, then goes to the plight of the modern creative worker and finally provides answers to reclaiming agency. It is part policy analysis and part manifesto. Now this review will be divided into three parts, the first being what is this book about, then some significant takeaways and finally what's my rating and should you read it. So what is this book about and what is choke point capitalism? Imagine you're an artist, a podcaster, eager to share your work. The digital age should make it easy, but you're also stuck navigating mega platforms like YouTube or Spotify. These giants quite often act as gatekeepers, wielding immense power over both creators as well as consumers. For creators, the relationship is paradoxical. They enrich these platforms that exploit them, offering exposure while pocketing most of the revenue. Spotify, for instance, pays artists a fraction of a cent per stream, a stark contrast to its own profits. Consumers are also trapped, they're more than spectators. They have monetized through engagement and behavioral data. Everything you scroll and click is captured and then ads are served to you and purchases are prompted. Sophisticated algorithms keep you hooked in, keep you scrolling, watching, making it difficult to leave the platform. This exploitation extends beyond creative fields. For instance, smaller companies which want to challenge, let's say, YouTube or Spotify are overshadowed by these digital giants, resort to squeezing more labor from overworked employees to stay competitive. Essentially, a large platform can decrease costs much more easily and thereby make it difficult for the true economic value to be paid out to smaller companies and thereby the smaller companies become unviable and unprofitable and unsustainable. In essence, we are facing a digital choke point orchestrated by a few monopolistic firms. As we engage with digital content, it's crucial to ask who truly benefits and at what cost. So next time you're streaming your favorite song or looping it on end, these are things which we should think about. Now, what did I take away from this book? And let me limit these to two big things which stood out for me. The first and the most important idea that I'm ashamed I did not know before reading this book was monopsony. Monopsony theory was developed by economist John Robinson in a book, The Economics of Imperfect Competition. And borrowing this framework, choke point capitalism explains how digital industries have few or standalone service providers and platforms with little competition. In these situations, the platforms act as single buyers. For numerous vendors, these vendors are creative artists, people like us, and who are in turn exploited. As the book notes, when you can work for only one person, and that person is the only person which buys your services. That person is not a customer, it's your boss. For instance, think of a creator that can publish a video but only on YouTube or primarily on YouTube. In such a situation, it is YouTube which as the buyer has all the power, it can set the price and the conditions of purchase by providing its platform. Or if you build your following on Twitter and you've done it over years, you are at the mercy of whatever terms now Elon Musk pushes onto you and if you disagree or annoy him, he blocks your account. So where else will you go? Yes, this guy.
This book does an excellent job outlining the problem in part one, like many policy non-fiction works. But what readers will appreciate is an honest and nuanced attempt at offering solutions, which is the second part of this two-part book. This brings me to the second major takeaway. The authors introduce a variety of solutions under the umbrella of ideas lying around. They discuss antitrust enforcement, transparency rights, collective action, and even time limits on copyright contracts. Most crucially, they advocate for uniting against choke point capitalism. I think one of the most valuable contributions of this book is addressing a key issue which is quite often not discussed when we discuss about policy interventions, which is that interventions are not automatic or do not enforce by themselves. It requires a level of power to go in and change the status quo. Here, public policy discourses around digital technologies have quite often not engaged with strategies for civic engagement, organizing collectives, and building mass movements. The authors emphasize that for things to change, the starting point is collective action. They mention feedback from a reader who loved the book but doubted its marketability, especially the second part, because its solutions were systemic and not individual. So in effect, an individual like me or you could not do anything. But that's precisely the point which the authors argue against. I do have some reservations about how they go about it, but mostly because it's underdeveloped and some readers may draw a false dichotomy that any kind of systemic change can't be done by individuals and thereby individual rights and collective rights are in a false dichotomy. In my opinion, empowering individual action while promoting collective organizing can be effective catalysts for progressive change. I find myself more aligned with the author's second point, which stresses the connection of various forms of rights, economic, political and civil. This approach is especially effective in unequal societies, where the fight for one type of right by one community can also bolster the fight for others. For instance, those who are fighting for economic justice, such as gig workers, do have an interaction in terms of their behavioral data determining their payouts. So at the same point in time, people who feel passionately about, let's say, data protection or privacy, need to work together with people who are fighting for better conditions of work in the gig economy. Now finally, what's my rating? I do appreciate this book, but can't say I'm enamored by it. My rating would be 4.0, slightly below its Goodreads score of 4.30. While the authors target a US audience, the book will inevitably find global readers. That's where I find its analysis limiting, particularly in part two, which discusses policy tools, given that the structural conditions in countries will be very varied. For instance, what will work in the United States will not work in India. The book also has its moments of clarity, especially when breaking down complex ideas for a general audience. However, it sometimes seems to lapse into dullness and repetition. I think it could have been better edited. That said, these issues don't overshadow the book's overall merit, its overarching theme. I readily recommend it to anyone interested in labor issues, the creative industries and technology platforms. While authors Giblin and Doctorow may not offer a complete blueprint for change, they excel at defining the problem and suggesting avenues for solutions. The book's real value lies in its ability to inspire hope. As the authors put it, change is iterative. The only way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. So if you like the book, you may also want to read this excellent interview with Doctorov in Jacobin, where he explains really cool concepts such as Mego. I've linked it as well as the Napster Metallica video and a bunch of links in the description. Hopefully, I'm also getting better at this YouTube thing. Thank you for tuning in and I hope to soon meet you again under the shade of a Amal tree.